Lord this morning. And you know what? There's no greater way to start off a worship service than to have baptism at the beginning because God is good. Amen. Amen. The power to change lives, that is what we are so thankful for. And this morning we get to baptize six individuals here in our church this morning. And so we praise God for that opportunity. Praise the Lord. You know, in Matthew chapter 3, we read about baptism and that Jesus himself was baptized. The Bible says in Matthew 3, 13, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. And Jesus answered him, Allow it for now, because this is, this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him to be baptized. After Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And there, was, there came a voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son. I take delight in him. And the Lord takes delight in days like today when more give their lives to Christ, but also make that public confession through baptism of a new life that has begun in Jesus Christ. This is Alex. Alex comes and has given his life to Christ, and we wanted to baptize him before now, but the pandemic held us up. And praise the Lord, the pandemic's gone, so we're going to be able to baptize him today. Alex, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. Do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Yes, I do. It is my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried into a death like his, and risen to walk in new life. Good job, buddy. baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried into a death like His, and risen to walk in new life. Good job, buddy. Megan came last week and said, I want to give my life to Christ. Megan, do you believe in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? I do. Do you believe that God raised Jesus on the third day? I do. It is my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried into a death like His, and risen to walk in new life. We still got time. If you want to get baptized, go home and grab a change of clothes. <laughs> it was a good day. Christ your Lord and Savior. Yes, sir. I do. You believe that God raised Jesus on the third day? Yes, sir. It is my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried into a death like His, and risen to walk in new life. Amen. 
bud. Here's his rag. More water, buddy. Angela comes this morning to be baptized as well. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as yes, your sir. Savior? Do you believe that God raised him on the third day? Yes, sir. It is my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried into a death like he is, and risen to walk in new life. Great day in the house of the Lord for sure. I'm going to ask uh, Pete, if you don't mind, would you pray over the candidates for baptism today? And then I'm going to turn it over. Shay's going to get us started. The first one is our regular offering, and then the RAs and GAs are going to come by and get your Annie Armstrong offering. So if you want to hold the Annie Armstrong for now, this is just for the regular offering right now. Um, and they will come behind uh, our ushers here in just a minute uh, to pick up the Easter offering for Annie Armstrong. All right, guys, y'all ready to do that? So if you got it in eggs or envelopes, you can put it in with any one of our um, GAs or RAs that are here. We do want to welcome you here this morning to the house of the Lord. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. There is nothing better than starting off with baptism, and we're thankful that you are here today. A few announcements we want to go over as we get started today. Don't forget... 5 o'clock tonight, uh, at 5 o'clock tonight we have our evening service, also F3 and uh, youth is at 5 o'clock, so come out, be a part of those things, and then Wednesday night at 7 o'clock is our RAs, GAs, youth, uh, the youth are at 6.30 on Wednesday nights, uh, RAs and GAs at 7 and adults at 7 o'clock. We have a prayer meeting tonight, so come out and be a part of that. A few other things uh, to go over. Next Saturday is a big day here at Mount Zion. We've got two massive projects going on on Saturday. This coming Saturday, we're going to put in a raised bed garden here in the back. And we need volunteers to help with that. It's going to be uh, a 24 by 48 raised bed garden. Uh, and we need help uh putting that in now we're going to start on saturday on that one jamie at eight yeah. what was that yeah. at eight o'clock we need hands to help us put that together also on saturday morning we're doing feed the hunger which is we're going to pack ten thousand meals in about two hours from 10 a.m till noon we need a few folks to get here about nine to help set up the equipment for that there is a sign up sheet in the vestibule for Feed the Hunger. Uh, but we need volunteers for both of these missions this coming Saturday uh, as we are going to do uh, everything we can to touch a whole lot of lives uh, on Saturday morning. So don't forget that. Uh, also, uh, keep your bulletins handy at all times as we have a whole lot going on. Uh, we've got um, Easter celebrations coming up with uh, our children and stuff, and there'll be more information coming out about that. We want to thank everybody who took part last night in helping with the baptist men's breakfast for supper 
Uh, and we had a great turnout there and a whole lot of food was made. Uh, and we do want to make a side note. Saturday, uh, when we do the, the garden project and we're doing Feed the Hunger, we're going to have some bacon biscuits here. So if you want to enjoy a biscuit on Saturday morning, we'll have that for you uh, here at the church. So don't forget that. And if you look, when you go out today, there are some sticky notes in the, on the bulletin board in the vestibule. Those are for two things. One is candy for the Easter celebration. If you can grab that and bring that back and give it to Renee, we'd greatly appreciate that. And number two, there is some needs for RAs and GAs. And so if you want to grab those and bring those back, uh, that would be great as well. Are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Renee? Yes, I did. In the sign-up sheet, yes. This, this, and I guess we'll go to the Wednesday for the Baptist Children's Home. Yes. And then we'll find out what we're going to do. Okay, so if you've got food for Baptist Children's Home, make sure it's in here by Wednesday, and then they're going to get it delivered sometime thereafter. All right, folks, well, let's stand together for our doxology. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. We, if, you, uh, if you got your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open them to John chapter 4. And uh, while we're doing that, let's have a, just a quick understanding of some things, what we're headed towards. I believe that God has, has blessed our church in a mighty way. And as God has blessed our church, what we've noticed is the more and more mission work we do, the more and more God continues to bless and so we're going to trust him in this. So understand what we're doing with this garden project. The garden project that we're doing is going to be a raised bed garden back here. But what we're going to do is when we harvest that this summer, Mount Zion is going to offer a free farmer's market to those in need in our community. We're not going to take a dime for it. We're just giving it. We have a lot of folks who are struggling right now financially even if they get assistance on that, they can't afford to get the stuff they truly need for nourishment. And so our goal is to be the hands and feet of Jesus and meet that need in the depth of their desperation. And so anybody who wants to help on this project, we're going to need people throughout the season, whether it's planting, whether it's picking, whether it's helping when we do uh, the farmer's market and stuff like that, we're going to need you. But why are we doing this? It is not because we want to say we're great, but we know that our God is great, and we know that he calls us to see the needs of those around us. And that's why we're doing this. It's why we're doing Feed the Hunger on Saturday. It's because in two hours, we can make an impact on 10,000 lives. And what, what a great testimony and what a great use of time and resource to be able to say, all right, Lord, you gave this to us. Now we're using this for your glory. And so it meets the needs of those who are in need. And when we do that, the Lord just continues to bless. Years ago, we tried uh, an in-ground garden. I'll, I'll tell you this, okay? If you don't know this story, some of you who may be new and maybe some people haven't heard it before. Uh, I was still the youth pastor at the time. And... For some reason, they didn't fire me then. I ain't figured that out yet why. But I was a youth pastor at that time, and for years we talked about building a building. And I remember telling the pastor at that time, I said, one of the reasons God has not allowed us to build that building is because we've never used the land that he gave us. And that first year, we tried to do an in-ground um, uh, field back there, uh, and, and it didn't go well at all because there are mighty big rocks back there. <laughs> Uh, we unearthed some, some major rocks, and then the next year we tried it different and tried it different. But once we started to utilize that within a couple of years, the Lord made a way, the building was built, and we're going to continue trusting him as we step out in ministry to glorify him. And, and it's amazing what God can do when our hearts are in the right place. And uh, the other day, the, the pantry got filled before I could even get that posted online. It had already gotten hit. Somebody had needed it. Yep. And we didn't even, before I could even get word out that that thing had been filled, there was already a car down there grabbing stuff because they needed it. Here's the beauty of it. God has equipped us to do great ministry. Now we're going to do great ministry for the glory of a great God that we serve. Amen. Now I want you to turn this morning in John chapter 4. 
And we're going to continue our invitation series. And I hope you're enjoying this. I, we had somebody come up to me last night and said, you know what, I've really enjoyed this. I've been hearing it on the radio. It means a lot to me. It's touched my life. And I hope it's touching yours as well because it's touching mine. Uh, as the Lord lays this out, his invitations to you and I, it's those invitations for us to be changed. It's that invitation, that call for us to find more in life, more than what we've known. And I want to start it this morning with this question. What do you see when you look at Jesus? What is it that you see? The question is a pertinent question because how we look at Jesus dictates how we approach him. Think about it in terms of life in general. You know, we all know there's certain people that we're very cautious when we approach them. Amen. Maybe it's because we've only seen the anger side of their life, right? Or maybe it's because we know how their personality is. We, we approach them a little differently, right? When I was younger, we always knew if you wanted to get something, you went to mama. Why? Because mama was a pushover, right? And, and all, I had, all I had to do was look at mama and go, but you're the best mommy in the world. And I had ice cream all day long. <laughs> and now my girls have learned the opposite exists in our house. They don't go to mama because mama always says no. In fact, I heard them in the hallway the other day. Cheyenne told all of them, said, why don't you go ask mama if we can have ice cream? She said, no, mama always says no. Let's ask daddy. <laughs> if you looked on Facebook, you saw evidence. They got ice cream and so did Brady and he had it from head to toe. But there are people that we don't approach because we know their attitude, things like that. We're, we're skittish when we approach them. And then there's other people that we can just be ourselves with. And thank God for those people. Amen. Yeah. There, there's people that you don't have to put up a front with. You can just be who you are, who God has called you to be, and you ain't got to worry about it because they ain't going to think nothing of it after it's over anyways. And I know immediately you've got people in your mind in those two categories. The people that you're skittish when you approach and other people you're just yourself with when you approach them. But let me ask you, how do you see Jesus? How do you see Jesus today? When you come before the Lord, do you put on a front? Or can you come just as you are? We say that he calls us to come as we are, but... Do we really actually believe that? So many times we come before the Lord as if we're putting on the performance of our lives. We feel like we have to say everything just right and we try to hold ourselves together. But what if I told you that you don't have to live like that anymore? You know, I believe that the Lord loves the broken prayer and the prayer that can't even be uttered more than he loves the most well-rehearsed one. I know he does. Christianity is not simply a religion. It's a relationship. And let me tell you this. There is no depth in any relationship if it's based on phony. Hear me, church. There is no depth to a relationship that is based on phony or fake or facades authenticity the deepest and purest relationships have authenticity at the core so let's see the invitation today the one that takes the relationship to the right place and it's an invitation for you and I to be broken you come into church this morning and you know we do that thing we, we, we polish it up before we hit the front door and, and, and because we don't want people to know we're struggling or we don't, don't want people to know that we got issues. We don't want people to know there's a brokenness inside us that exists that few, if anybody, truly understands. We walk in the door of the church and we put on a show, but it's as hollow as can be. No, you see, here's the thing. When we come into the house of the Lord, we're coming to be, we're called to come in and be who we are. You ain't got to be put together here. I don't care what the world tells you about your life. 
when you come in here, you ain't got to be put together because I believe in a God who puts us together and holds us together. Amen. And the greatest thing we can do is be honest and be real. And so we're going to see this in John chapter 4. I'm going to make you turn a little bit today because I want to see how Jesus kind of extends this invitation in a multitude of ways to different people. And I know I've got to hurry through this today, but hang on tight. Look with me at John chapter 4, well-known story. We touched on this one a few weeks ago for those who were here. I, I can't remember if it was Wednesday night or Sunday night. We talked about the invitation to come to the waters. But there's also another invitation that Jesus extends to the woman at the well. And it's an invitation that you and I need to see. Look with me at John 4, verse number 7. Now, here's what's happened up to this point. We're in the middle of the day, the heat of the day. All right, and this woman comes to the well expecting to encounter nobody. Why? Because everybody else knows. Go ahead and get this out of the way early in the day when it's cool outside. But she has to come during the middle of the day, or she feels that way. She expects to encounter no one, but there sits Jesus, the perfect person for her to encounter. And now here's what happens. Verse number 7. Um, in in um, John 4, verse number 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep, so where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. And Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again, ever. In fact, the water I will give him will become a, a well of water springing up within him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go, call your husband. He told her, and come back here. I don't, I don't have a husband. She answered. You have correctly said, I don't have a husband, she, Jesus said, for you've had five, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I, I perceive that, or I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, yet you, say, you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is here now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I am he, Jesus told her, the one speaking to you. Here's how we know there's an invitation. We see it in this interaction. And here's the first truth I want you to write down today. He knows your past, your pain, and your shame. Jesus knows your past your pain, and your shame. As the woman approached the well, the very time of day she approached it said there was a massive issue. The typical trip to the well happened early in the morning before the heat of the day. So let's understand the time frame just a little bit. The Jewish day begins at sundown. And if you look at verse 6, it says that it was 6 in the evening. Well, that would be noon, our time. And he, here she had to do the most laborious work of the day and chose to do it when it was at the hottest. Why? Because of her life. She made mistakes. But all of us have. She stumbled. And all of us do. See, so easy for it. For us, is it to look at somebody like the woman at the well and go, I can't believe she would do that. But then we have to look in the mirror and say, I can't believe what I've done. 
for her, she came in the heat of the day because she just couldn't take it anymore. She was tired of the comments. She had grown, she had grown weary of avoiding the looks that people would give to her. She worried about what people said about her, and she didn't want to hear the murmurs anymore. So she came when she thought no one would be there, but the one was there. And here's where I want you to see that invitation. Look at verse number 16. It's kind of a hidden invitation there that Jesus offers. But he's gonna, he talks to us in the same way. He, he relates with us in the exact same way. In verse number 16, he said, go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. Jesus knew her lifestyle, but gave her a chance to be broken. He said, all right, go call your husband and come back. And in verse 17, she does exactly what we do. She said, I don't have one. How many of y'all know a lot of times we church stuff up in prayer? Amen. We, we church it up when we get before the Lord. Why? Because it, it needs to be churched up. We don't want to be like, Lord, I am a dreadful sinner. Lord, I, I can't even believe what went through my head an hour ago. We don't want to do that, do we? We'll say, Lord, you know, I might have made a mistake at 3.30. But we don't want to get into the depth of that issue. And she didn't want to do it neither. She was like, uh, when the Lord said, go call your husband, she was like, um, how about I ain't got one? Let's go there. I don't have one. He said, yeah, you're right. You've had five. The one you have now ain't yours. And what does that tell us? That the Lord was inviting her to be broken. He wasn't chastising. He was inviting her to be broken before him. He was inviting her to say, I messed up. My life is messed up. And that's where I'm at. Too often we are trying to put on, uh, it's like putting a lipstick on a pig. Yep. <laughs> it's still a pig, amen. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Nobody looks at their pig and says, let me slap lipstick on it, it will look better. No. But that's what we do with our sin in our lives. We're like, you know what, if I can gloss over this for a minute, maybe it ain't as bad as I think it is. Then that glossiness is wiped away and reality sits in. Jesus said, here's where you're at. He said, he invited her to be broken by saying, you've had five and the one you have now isn't your own. But notice this, and here's what I want you to see. This is the amazing thing about Jesus and our brokenness. After he says that to her, she begins talking again and he stays put. He does not run away from your brokenness. And we can all say praise God for that. Because we're broken people. And we can put on a show all we want to, but underneath the show is the reality. We are broken people. And Jesus didn't run away from her brokenness. No, he offered to heal the brokenness inside of her. It's amazing. The world pushed her out, but Jesus welcomed her in. I would much rather be pushed out by the world and welcomed in by Jesus than to be pushed out by Jesus and welcomed in by the world. Amen. And that is the invitation that he offers you and I today. He said, quit playing. Come to me as you are, because I'm the only one who's going to put it back together. We can try to put it back together, and it don't work. It does not work. We've got a toy at the house that has been super glued no less than 175 times. And every time it gets into one of our children's hands, it is broken again. And that is like our lives. When put in our hands, it ends up broken. But when put into the hands of the Lord, he puts it back together. The only one who will heal your brokenness is Jesus Christ. He alone can heal brokenness. And this woman came to the place on the day at the time where she thought she'd be alone, but she ran into the healer in the midst of her hurt. And I think right now we need to run into the healer in the midst of our hurts. 
the Lord meant to be there on that day, on that time, for that woman. It wasn't a mistake. A change began in her life. No longer worried about what people thought, she ran and told everybody about who she met. Before, she didn't even want to face people at the well. But after she talked to Jesus, she ran back. She said, I don't care what you think about me. Let me tell you the one who knew everything about me. He already knows your life. He knows what you've done. He knows the pains that you carry. He knows that some of us are riddled by shame. But you see, he carried shame to the cross with him. Not just sin, but shame as well. He knows that some of us are, are riddled by guilt. But there's a place to be washed clean and free of guilt. And that's in Jesus Christ. He knows that there are some here who are carrying around pains of things that happened many years ago. No matter what we do, we, we can't heal that hurt, but he can. And he invites us to come and be healed of the hurts of the past. You see, he knows you and he doesn't cast you out. He welcomes you in. The Lord invites you to be broken before him because he knows the brokenness inside of you. Turn with me now to John 11, just a few chapters over, because I want you to see every bit of this. Not only does he know you, he knows your past, your pains, your shame, everything that is pulling at you and, and just dragging at you in your life, he already knows every detail about it. In fact, he knows more of the details than you even know about it. Because he knows everything. But not only does he know that, he understands pain. A lot of times when we look at Jesus, we, we don't see him as one who understands pain. But he understands pain. John chapter 11, and the story is, is the, when Lazarus has passed away. And I want you to look at verse number 17 uh, with me. It said, when Jesus arrived, and he was told two days prior that Lazarus, you know, he was told earlier that Lazarus was sick and he remained where he was for a couple days. And, and he, when he gets there, Lazarus has passed away. And says, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the, in the tomb for four days. And Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary uh, to comfort them about their brother. And as soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But, but Mary remained seated in the house. And then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here. You know, and that, that is us sometimes. Lord, where were you? Where were you? I think probably if we're honest, every one of us in this room has asked that question. Where were you? At some moment in time in life, our question was, where were you? And, and that's what Martha said. She said, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. If only you would have gotten here in time, this would all have been avoided. Where were you? We called for you. And, but look at what she says in verse number 22. She says, yet now, even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. And Martha said, I... I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die ever. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. Having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and calling for you. And as soon as she heard this, she got up quickly and went to meet him. Jesus had yet, not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. So they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to cry there. And when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you were here, 
if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She said, Jesus, where were you? Where were you? When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was angry in his spirit and deeply moved. Where have you put him, he asked. Now, I want to explain this so you get the context. He was not angry at Mary and Martha. Don't, don't translate that wrong in your life or in your brain. The Greek word here is a highly impactful Greek word. He was angry at the shackles of sin and the tyranny of sin that leads to death. He was angry because this is what death le- this is what sin leads to. It leads to death. And you're going to see twice in this passage Jesus would get indignant at sin. Now, it would be just a short time later that he would go to the cross for all those sins and and that he would die on the cross and, and win the victory over the grave and over death. But here, when we say he identifies with it, I want you to see the emotions that Jesus shows here in this passage. Number one, he's angry at what has happened to Lazarus. Now, he already knows what he's getting ready to do. He's getting ready to call Lazarus out of that grave. All right? As the song says, he's turning a grave into a garden. And that's, that's the amazing thing he's getting ready to do. But even at that, he was angry because here is what sin led to. The existence of sin in the world means what? Death. It means death. Go back to the Garden of Eden. Go as far back to the Garden of Eden. This is what happened. This is what entered the world when sin entered the world. And Jesus is angry at the fact that sin still had its tyrannical reign in life it goes on to say this after he asked where have you put him lord they told him come and see jesus wept two two emotions that we get out of jesus right here one he's angry at what had happened and number two he is filled with sorrow even though he knows he is about to raise lazarus from the grave he knows that the man who is laying in that tomb is about to walk out of that tomb. He's still moved by the brokenness of Mary and Martha, his friends. He's moved by the condition of all of humanity. Jesus not only understands it, he identifies with the pain. Because he understands it better than we do. Says, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened a blind man's eyes kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, angry in himself again. Here we see the anger again. Frustrated with the reality. Came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Removed the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, uh, told him, he's been decaying. Uh, Lord, he's already decaying. It's been four days. Jesus said to him, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you hear, always hear me because of the crowd. Stand here, I said this, so they may believe that you sent me. And after this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips, with, the fa- with his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. You see, the, the sisters felt the pain of death. Their brother had passed. And each one said to Jesus, where were you? If only you were here. But notice what he didn't do. He never rebuked them for that. He never rebuked them for their pain. He didn't say, how dare you talk to me like that? How dare you question where I was at? Did he ever do that? No. He did not rebuke them. Because he understood where they were at. He reassured them. And he cried right alongside of them. So often we read through this so fast because we just want to get to the resurrection part that we miss the beauty of what Jesus did there because he showed how connected he is to his people. Amen. Amen. He was so connected that they were like, you know what? You could have made me, this could have been avoided. And he said, 
I know. They're crying. I mean, they were just torn to shreds. And here is Jesus crying right alongside of them. Two times in this passage we see that he's angry at, at the state of sin and what sin does to our lives. We see in this passage where he wept. In the presence of the hurting, he felt the hurt. And that's what he feels in your life and mine as well. He feels our hurts and he calls us to bring those hurts straight to where the hurts meet the healer. Holding it inside never helps. The help comes in letting go so the healing can begin. You know, Psalms has this beautiful verse that says, The Lord is near the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Hear me. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. There are moments where you may struggle to take the next breath. And then you feel that hand on your back and nobody's there. And you realize that you had to touch the Lord on your life for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. There are moments where you're going, I don't know that I can make it through. And then the Father comes and he gets you through. The Bible tells us that we can get to a place sometimes that our suffering is so strong that we can't even pray. And they, I guarantee you we have all had times in our lives where we could not even pray in that moment because we were just shattered by something in our lives. And the Bible says that God even takes care of that, that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit intercedes and, and grumbles and groans for us on our behalf to the Lord. When we can't even pray, God said, I'll help you out in that minute too. Why? Because he is there in the midst of our struggle and our suffering like no one else can be. And he reaches in and gives strength in the suffering and in the struggle. And that's what he did with Mary Martha. He didn't once say, you're out of line. He said, I get it. And he wept right alongside him. I want you to turn one last place for me today as we look at the invitation to be broken. And it's in Luke. So look at Luke 18. I know I'm out of time, so I'm just going to touch on this for a minute. But I want... Look, the Lord's doing something right now. We're going to trust Him to do whatever He does. Amen. But I think He wants us to understand Him better and to be willing to come to Him for what we need. We have tried for so long to do so much of our lives on our own. And as we learned last week, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden. And we're all like, man, that's us. That's the whole bunch of us. I mean, seriously, I, I slept well last night. I literally slept well last night. How do you think Jesus? And I slept so well that when we did Sunday school this morning, a couple of the youth looked at me and go, man, you really got a lot of energy today. <laughs> and Spencer had to point out, yeah, he's got a Red Bull. And I looked at Spencer and I said, I ain't even drank it yet. Eh. <laughs> what? Because here's the thing. I believe that the Lord's calling us to this place where we're like, all right, Lord, it's yours. I'll do whatever you call me to do. Do my part and you handle the rest. And you know what happens when we do that? We start resting a whole lot better because he's handling the outcome. But also he's calling us to be broken before him and quit playing charades. Quit playing a game of not who we are when we can come before him just as we are. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 is where we're going to begin. This is a parable. Jesus is telling a parable. But it illustrates the point of what the Lord desires to see in your life and in mine every single day. And, and here's a little side note that was not in my notes, but I think we need to point it out. All right. Go back this week. And look at uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Look at Matthew 5 through 7. I want you to go back this week and see how many times Jesus said this. He warns in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, don't be like the Pharisees. And, and what he said in there, he said they're hypocrites. And there's another word they use that basically is play actors. He said they play the part, but that's not who they are. And what Jesus was saying was, I want the authentic, 
I don't, I don't want, I don't want the show. I don't want the fake. I want what is real. And you see that in Luke 18, look at verse number nine. He, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everybody else. And that's a lot of people in our world today. Don't be them. But in this, there's an invitation to be honest. He said, he, two men went up to the temple complex to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Pharisee took his stand and was praying like this, God, I thank you that I'm not like everybody else. I've heard those prayers before, haven't you? He said, I thank you I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He said, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest saying, God, turn your wrath from me, a sinner. I tell you this, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. Here's what Jesus said. Don't puff it up when you come before me and don't church it up when you come before me. Come before me just like you are and be honest about where you are. Lord, I'm a mess. I need you to put this back together. Yes. Jesus pointed out, he said, one of these guys was religious and one of these guys was in need of what only I can do. Amen. Now, which one are you going to be? We can go before the Lord and we can put on a show, but he's going to see right through it. He's going to see absolutely through it. Or we can go before him and we say, Lord, I'm broken. Lord, I'm hurting. Lord, I'm sad. Lord, I'm hurt. Lord, I'm frustrated. Because a lot of us are frustrated in our lives too. Or we can keep carrying that mess the rest of our lives. But how well has that worked out for us up to this point? Jesus said, I don't call you to be something you're not. I call you to be honest about who you are. I don't call you to church it up. But I call you the church that I'm building up. The question is, are we going to accept that invitation or are we just going to keep playing the, the part? You know what happens when you play a part long enough? You wear yourself out. But it's okay to come before Jesus and be broken, to be hurt, to be wounded, to be frustrated. It's okay to come before him and say, Lord, I've made a mess. Because when we do, that's when the healing begins. Because that's us being real before a real God who can fix it. He already knows your story. But he's working to bring out a different ending to it. But the only way you'll see it is if you come as you are. Let's stand as we close today. The invitation there is to be broken before the Lord, to be honest before the Lord. If you're hurt, say, Lord, I need you to heal these hurts. If you're wounded, say, Lord, I need you to heal up these wounds. Father, I need you to reach into the depths of my life that no one else can reach. And I need you to do that today. Because at the altar is the place where the hurt and the healer collide. There at the throne of grace is where the hurt and the healer collide together. And where the healing begins. We're going to close with hymn number 435, I believe it is.